Let me introduce you to my guest tonight. I'm very happy to have with me. Gisu Nia is the director of the Strategic Litigation Project at the Atlantic Council. The Strategic Litigation Project works on prevention and accountability efforts for atrocity crimes, human rights violations, terrorism, and corruption offenses around the world. She serves as board chair of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, where she's helping develop and oversee the group's human rights advocacy and legal programs, which seek to promote accountability, respect for human rights, and the rule of law in Iran. Gisunia, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. So I'm so happy to have you on because I uh, want to keep the conversation about what is going on in Iran going and also for me to learn more about what's happening and I thought you'd be a great person to bring on to tell us a bit more about how we got here, what's going on, even some things individuals can do but also the international community can do based on your experience and expertise. But maybe a good place to start is looking at what's happening in Iran right now and giving some historical context because of course these are not the first protests and uprisings but these do seem to feel a bit different but I want to get your perspective on the historical context and also if this time does feel different yeah um, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have been following you know what's been happening in Iran and what the spark was that led to this recent spate of protests but there have been recurring protests in the country since December 2017 and the space between protests has been shortening every time. Mm. So throughout this period, we've even seen that labor union strikers have been striking over lost wages or unpaid wages um, when essentially publicly owned companies have been sold, sold off to private owners who are close to government officials and they don't know how to run a company and they sort of loot the company and don't mm. pay the wages. So these have been recurring throughout this period. But I think what feels really different about this raft of protests is that um, it really was sparked due to demands for social change. So although the protests in November 2019, for instance, where hundreds if not thousands of protesters were killed in the space of a mm -hmm. few days and when the um, Islamic Republic shut off the internet and basically did this in online darkness. Um, that was sparked because of a sudden removal in subsidies on gas and the sort of spike in gas prices. Now, the protests quickly turned anti-government in nature with anti-government slogans and saying death to the dictator and death to the Islamic Republic. But I guess outside commentators could kind of say, well, you know, there was an economic reason mm -hmm. that these protests started or they could um, essentially say that if the economy was doing better, then these protests wouldn't be happening. Um, you can't say that about this series of protests right now. This is squarely about the core of the ideology of the Islamic Republic, the fact that it has a legal discriminatory framework in place that discriminates not only against women, but ethnic and religious minorities, mm -hmm. LGBTQ populations. So this is really about social change. The people who are in the streets are very young. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are under the age of 25. The average age of protesters who've been killed is 20. Mm. There are 18 or we got reports up to 26 children under the age of 18 who've been killed. So this is a very youth-driven protest, and they're essentially just saying that they want to live a quote-unquote normal life. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to socialize with who they want to socialize with, listen to the music they want to listen to, they want to dress the way they want to dress, and that's really what's at the core of these protests, which are now entering the fourth week. Yeah, that's. Um, thank you for that. That was a great uh, outline of some of the things that are going on, and and even what you talked about of what people are protesting about. Um, overall, I mean, a lot of your audience have been disappointed in the lack of media coverage, and then also sometimes the misrepresentation of some of the the issues in the media. I don't know if you've seen some of that, or any thoughts you have on, you know, sometimes it, sometimes I've seen it being presented as just an economic concern being at the core of, of what's going on when it's much more than that. Well, there was a report that I was um, that I contributed to the other day where one of the protesters from inside Iran was speaking to the reporter and said that he doesn't understand why there's not more coverage of this because this is like a Tahrir Square moment. Um, he views this as an uprising and an uprising for freedom. So very much in the way that 
brave Egyptians took to the street back in 2011 to protest against Mubarak at the time, he sees this as something similar. Mm -hmm. And that's a sentiment that I've heard from a lot of folks that we're in touch with on the ground and those that have, you know, bravely taken to the streets. So this isn't really about just, well, if the economy is better, then we won't, you know, come to the streets. No, Mm -hmm. you know, the economy is not going to change the fact that the Islamic Republic created a morality police. It's not going to help reform Iran's Islamic penal code, which essentially says that morality crimes can be punished with death and and they are often when it comes to women or crimes of adultery and things like that. Like the economy is not going to help that. Right. Um, so I think there's multi, like multi-layered problems here, and it's very important to focus on what the protesters themselves are saying mm-hmm. instead of reading other things into what you know outside concerns may be or um, an analysis of why it is that they're taking to the streets we can just ask them themselves yeah and speaking of that you know asking themselves so you've been able to communicate with some people in iran who've been protesting yeah that's that that's incredible and so um they've been telling you that they're disappointed in how little media coverage there's well, been well the thing about talking to folks in Iran right now is that, it, you know, the internet um, yeah. connectivity really varies and so depending on where they're located, sometimes there can be lag times of up to 20 minutes for you know your message to be received and things like that, but um, what we're overwhelmingly hearing is that people are angry and mad about what happened to Masajina Amini but they're mad on a, just a, a larger scale of having to deal with you know, oppressive laws and a system in which they don't feel they have a lot of room to maneuver. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's really important that we listen to these young people and prioritize what they're saying. I think all we have to do is see that, you know, their leadership is incredibly disconnected from them. Um, The average age of anybody on the Guardian Council or in any of these governing positions is 70 plus. Mm -hmm. And these children, I mean, these kids, you know, they're what we would refer to as Generation Generation Z. They're all under the age of 25, and they don't have any memory of the revolution of 79. Right. They mm-hmm. weren't connected to that revolutionary fervor or whatever ideals were driving that forward. And so they just want a different life now, and they want to come out of global isolation and, you know, just, just have the experiences that they see online because mm-hmm. a lot of these... Um, kids are, you know, using TikTok. They're using online platforms that they can access through VPNs if they're, you know, services that are blocked in Iran. And they see how other kids around the world live. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not something that's a secret for them. And that's what they want. Yeah, I think that's, um, Gen Z has been at the forefront a lot. Of, of course, women have been at the forefront of this this movement. And I think, yeah, they they see online that this is not the reality they have is not the reality they need to have, and they're, they're fed up. So I think, as you said, it's not just, of course, it's about Maso Gina Amini and her, her death, which, of course, many women can relate to, sadly, those who've also been killed or who have been harassed in a variety of levels. But, of course, it's about many things. A movement rarely is about just one thing. But I think it's important, as you said, that we amplify the voices of the people in Iran more than anything. And so related to that, what would you encourage Iranians outside of Iran, what can they do? Of course, many people they think is is what I'm doing doing anything. Does it have an impact? What would you recommend or encourage people to do if they want to try to help the people of Iran? It has a major impact. Um, I think the fact that Iran, you know, the Iranian diaspora has been coming out full force mm-hmm. in solidarity marches. They've been sharing online content and keeping awareness up. It makes a huge difference um, because in order for global leaders to pay attention and want to prioritize this file, they need to feel that their constituencies are asking for it. So that's huge. Um, A lot of folks have been calling their representatives, their elected representatives if they live in a democracy and 
basically asking for action. Mm -hmm. And you know, that action can take a range of forms, but I think there's a lot of baseline things that countries and the international community can do to help the protesters in Iran and basically not to get in their way. Yeah. And so, you know, that includes things like ensuring that there's a UN mechanism that can investigate what's, you know, in terms of the violations that the government is committing to basically keep um, a repository of that evidence that could be admissible in any future trials against mm -hmm. these perpetrators. Um, that could look like wanting to crack down on Islamic Republic officials and those who are linked to the regime that have their assets offshore. So a lot of these, you know, people who are publicly denouncing the West, their children live, work, and study in North America and Europe, mm -hmm. and they themselves have assets and property abroad. And so a lot of times people are really surprised to hear that because they think that due to, you know, targeted sanctions and a lot of tough rhetoric that that wouldn't be the case, but it actually is. So we've got to close those loopholes. Yeah. Yeah, because I think even myself included in this, when I talk to some people, they're like, we're, we're not even sure what to hope for, like how people can help, like as far as other countries. And of course, there's a history of uh, the West trying to help, maybe with air quotes and sometimes serving their own motives and, you know, maybe making a mess of things more than helping. So so I think people are wondering, should we, you know, be asking people, but you're saying, yeah, reach out to your public officials. I think, yeah, awareness is one of the things we have to make sure that this doesn't die out or that the attention doesn't die out, especially with the Internet being, um, you know, so compromised within Iran. So as you know, this is one of those things where I think, you know, being a, a what is it, a keyboard warrior, people are sometimes like, does it make a difference? And this is one of those instances where it actually can make a difference just to make sure it's out there. People are seeing the videos, footage, whatever it is that you can share to keep doing that. You're saying you think that does have an impact. Absolutely. I mean, right now, for example, at the UN, there is a range of priorities. There is the fact that Russia had launched a full-scale invasion mm -hmm. in Ukraine back in February. There is the flawed withdrawal from Afghanistan. There are the issues affecting the Uyghurs in China. So, you know, there's no short list, basically, yeah. of issues that the UN is dealing with and that are um, before the UN Human Rights Council. So in order for Iran and what's happening within the territory of Iran to be viewed as a priority, there really needs to be that sense of public pressure that, mm -hmm. you know, not only the Iranian diaspora community, but that others are calling for it. So when Dua Lipa tweeted, mm -hmm about it it actually makes a difference yeah. um, so it's not just for fluff and it's not just some sort of performative um, solidarity or activism it actually makes a difference in mm -hmm. terms of world leaders saying oh this is on the agenda of you know people uh, they're watching they're paying attention it matters to them so it does actually make a difference um, all the more so if you're a constituent of an elected representative and you're, if you're calling their office and letting them know that you care um, our contacts on the hill were saying you know in the past weeks that they were just getting deluged by calls or that there was a significant amount of really? calls hmm. i cannot verify if that's definitely the case yeah. but that's what we've heard so if it is like well done to yeah. everybody who's doing that and it does make a difference because then they have to prioritize yeah it's so nice to hear you say that because i know you're saying you couldn't confirm it but that you've heard that at some level because you know I left a message for a few uh, elected officials and it's like you're almost like you're just you're shouting into the abyss because you don't hear it sometimes you can if you write they might r respond but you're just leaving a message and you don't know if it has any impact but it's nice to hear yeah they do even if they're not necessarily responding obviously each person but they take I'm sure some kind of general note of what's coming in so it does make a difference so yeah if you have done that continue to do so if you haven't done it call your representatives leave them a message people you can find scripts if you're not comfortable about what to say those are out there but just say something just say pay attention to what's going on in iran and that's something that's important to you and it does have an impact i, I appreciate you you sharing that um we are at a commercial break again my guest tonight is Guy Sunia, and we're talking about the situation in iran what you can do what hopefully the international community will continue to do and we'll continue the discussion after the break welcome back again my guest tonight human rights lawyer Gisu Nia. Gisu, we were talking before the break about a bunch of different, you know, issues related to what can the international community do. And one very charged word that comes up a lot in these types of discussions is sanctions. 
And so I wanted to get your thoughts. I know it's a very broad topic, but some thoughts on sanctions, because sometimes people just think, is it good or bad? Should we have them or not? But I'm sure the answer is much more complex than that. So I wanted to get your thoughts on yeah. that topic. I think there's a lot of confusions about mm-hmm. confusion about what sanctions are. There's lots of different types of sanctions. So the sort of sanctions that I work on are targeted human rights sanctions. What that means is asset freezes or travel bans on top violators, like human rights violators that are in the Islamic Republic, Mm -hmm. that are part of the leadership, that are responsible for torturing prisoners in custody, responsible for not giving fair trials, for sentencing juveniles to execution, you know, that kind of offense. That is who we seek to have targeted human rights sanctions on. And a lot of commentators might say, well, these are just symbolic. You know, a lot of these folks don't really have assets elsewhere because obviously the assets that could be frozen aren't, you know, they wouldn't apply to any assets that are in Iran, obviously. Mm -hmm, There would be no jurisdictional reach. But let's say... The EU, for example, wants to use their global Magnitsky type sanctions, which is a specific type of sanctions that will sanction human rights violators from anywhere in the world. Let's say they want to use that and sanction somebody who's high up in the intelligence ministry for what they see as, you know, surveillance of journalists and torture of journalists or something along these lines. Um, A lot of times the argument is, well, you know, they don't have any assets in the European Union, so why would this be useful? But that's not necessarily true. A lot of the mid to lower level perpetrators actually do have assets in North America and Europe. Um, A lot of times it's, you know, there's a range of ways that they try to hide those assets so that it's not title in their name. Also, their children live, work, and study in North America and Europe, as I've said. So there's a lot of ways that this money can make it into other jurisdictions outside of Iran, Mm -hmm. and there should be a zero-tolerance policy for that. Now, for any assets that are actually there, I think it's not only enough to just freeze them, because freezing the assets is really supposed to try to induce behavior change. Sanctions, targeted sanctions at their core, are really about trying to change the behaviors of the individuals that the targeted sanctions are placed on. Mm -hmm. We saw that, for example, with Russian oligarchs and with countries trying to seize their yachts and prevent them from getting visas. And because they enjoy these very lavish lifestyles outside of Russia, the view was that that might induce them to make some changes. But with the situation of Iran, where you have chronic human rights violators and where some of these individuals don't appear to be interested in modifying their behavior, I think there's a real argument to say that targeted sanctions should be used as accountability tools instead. And what I mean by that is that I think some of those assets need to be seized Mm -hmm. in very much the same way that the Russian oligarch yachts were. Um, And those assets need to be liquidated or used um, to basically rehabilitate victims and survivors of the crimes of the perpetrators that the assets were seized from. So essentially a transfer from perpetrator to victim. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what I'd like to see happen. There's a lot of legal hurdles to that happening. Canada is the first country that has passed legislation that would allow for such a repurposing of seized assets of human rights violators. And so I think other countries need to follow their example. But Canada also needs to actually get serious about applying that legislation to the many individuals within its borders that have connections Mm. to the IRGC or like the children of SEPA who are there. Yeah. Um, So the the targeted sanctions, when you're saying that would almost most people in the higher government be like, would they fall under that category of people who've done human rights violations at some level? I mean, would it be pretty broad based amongst the government if that were the case? So a lot of um, government officials in Iran already have, like the, at the higher level, have mm-hmm. some kind of targeted sanctions on them. But a lot of those sanctions were issued in conjunction to alleged nuclear activities or ballistic missiles programs or other things that are more security related, Mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily issued on the basis of human rights violations. And the reason that that matters is because what I'm proposing in terms of transferring the assets from the perpetrators to the victims 
would only be possible if those are human rights focused mm -hmm. targeted sanctions because then there would be a sufficient link between the activity that they're being sanctioned for and you know the person that and the victim or survivor that the assets are going to. Um, the other day we saw that the U.S. government issued a new raft of sanctions on seven you know, top senior um, leaders within the Islamic Republic who are responsible for internet censorship and internet locked internet shutdowns and also violence on protesters one of those individuals had previously been designated under you know nuclear program authorities but now he was redesignated with the human rights targeted sanctions and mm. so i think we need to see more of that for anybody in the leadership that is culpable um you know has culpability for human rights violations and do those types of sanctions have fairly immediate effect like or uh, impact i should say would it you know do you see that in what's happening right now in iran and everything it's very dynamic and, and things are you know day to day might be changing do you think that could have a more short-term impact or is that something that might have a longer term well i think it'll definitely have an accountability there's an accountability yeah. aspect to it which i think is a longer term type of process but um what it does is it immediately um, as soon as you know the sanctions orders are um, handed down and also banks and any relevant authorities are alerted to the the designation then it would mean that the, their assets are frozen mm -hmm. and also that they have travel bans so if they previously were getting visas into a country that has now issued a travel ban then they would no longer have that kind of access right. and so again a lot of high level officials in the Islamic Pro Republic already have targeted sanctions on them but a lot of mid to lower perpetrators don't necessarily um, there is also, you know, somewhat counterintuitively, the interesting thing is that with some of the mid to lower level perpetrators that are alleged to be leaving Iran, you know, I've seen these reports about plane loads of people leaving. Obviously, we would need to verify that. But um, the thing is that if they end up in countries like Sweden, Germany, France, countries that have a system of what's called universal jurisdiction, then it's actually possible for there to be criminal prosecutions of mm. these individuals if they've committed crimes against humanity or torture. Um, we, The Iranian human rights community will be very familiar with the first ever universal jurisdiction trial against a representative of the Islamic Republic for core international crimes that was just completed in a Swedish district court this past July. Mm. Um, Hamid Nouri was the defendant and he was convicted um, for his crimes during the 1988 killings of thousands of political oh. prisoners in Iran's jails. Mm. So that was the first ever universal jurisdiction trial on Iran for those core international crimes. Um, we could see a lot more of that if some of these mid to lower level perpetrators are indeed fleeing very much similar into the way that there have been universal jurisdiction trials um, for the crimes that have been committed in the Syrian conflict that have um, been adjudicated in Germany and elsewhere. So, so as you're saying, uh, you know, it's definitely far more than just symbolic, the impact of these types of targeted sanctions and what people might think of as hurting the people more. That's more like the broad based sanctions that often get yeah applied. there's different types of sanctions there's broad-based economic sanctions which um you know can result in inflation and um different outcomes and then there's the targeted sanctions that i'm talking about which mm -hmm. are really just designations on individuals they're intended to restrict those individuals movement or their ability to benefit from the global financial system and so there should be no opposition from anybody to those kinds of targeted right. sanctions. And if there is opposition, they're probably part of the Islamic Republic, because mm -hmm. I can't imagine otherwise why they would be opposed right. to such a measure. So it's really important to differentiate, because I think yeah. a lot of times people talk about sanctions, and there's a sort of you know negative association um, with sanctions, but like there are different types of sanctions and mm -hmm. targeted sanctions on individuals who are committing gross human rights violations are definitely sanctions that are worth pursuing. Yeah, that makes sense. It's that there's the accountability piece and then targeting the people who are, you know, the perpetrators rather than the broad-based sanctions can sometimes affect the general population much more than those in power. And so it kind of could feel like it's just actually benefiting the, those in power to some degree. You know, earlier in the last segment you talked about how there is you know as people are talking about this does feel different these protests and i know things are still very hazy and there's 
limited communication, and of course the government doesn't try to release what they are doing. But the protests, you feel like, are different. How the government is responding, do you feel like that's kind of their same the same things, or do you notice anything different in the government response thus far? Well, in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. um, right now, you know, there's different estimates, but the group Harana, um, human rights activists in Iran, which is, you know, a citizen journalist collective inside the country that produces pretty reliable data. They, as of today, they've said that there's roughly 5,500 arrests, at least 5,500 arrests, many of whom are students, journalists, um, lots of artists and activists that were just preemptively rounded up. Um, they are reporting that there might be close to 200 deaths total, um, though they don't, you know, we don't yet have yeah. accurate numbers. Um, and the protests are very widespread. So, you know, they're in every province and there's hundreds of protests that have been, individual protests that have been recorded and documented. Um, so what that means is that these protests are widespread. Um, we did see that on Saturday, you know, Tehran's bazaar was basically mm -hmm. shut down, mm -hmm. which is very symbolic. Um, I mean, very um, significant because those were really, you know, people that were at the core of the revolution of 79. So the fact that this is definitely like the middle to lower classes coming out and protesting, which is the base upon which the revolution was founded, is really quite significant. I think the population is pretty angry that... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the ruling elites basically are living lavish lifestyles. In past years, there have been Instagram accounts and Twitter accounts dedicated to sort of revealing like the lifestyles of quote unquote the Aghazadehs, basically like the children of these supposedly pious elites. And you see that their only God is really money, power, and it's all through corrupt means, right? So understanding that is, you know, really, I think, um, reflective of the disconnect between the people and um, the rulers who mm -hmm. basically no longer properly represent them. Um, but in terms of response, I mean, we're seeing that the Islamic Republic is engaging in violence. So there was a pretty bloody um, situation in Zahedan and Sistan mm -hmm. and Baluchistan province um, about a week ago. And then um, we saw that, you know, um, yesterday and today, the Islamic Republic of Iran state security forces are going into Sanandaj and um, Kurdistan province and essentially like clamping down. We heard gunfire um, and use of tear gas. We saw that the Islamic Republic was besieging Sharif University of Technology, mm -hmm. which is really like, you know, Iran's MIT, essentially mm -hmm. one of the top engineering schools in the world and sort of, you know, shooting paintballs at, cho at, at the students who are just running with their backpacks and that's Iran's best and brightest. Mm -hmm. So this um, Islamic Republic seems that it actually, if it says it cares about its economy, I mean, I don't understand how shooting at your most talented, brightest mm -hmm. minds would serve any purpose. So I think it becomes clear, like, this is all about preservation of power and not really yeah. about the future of Iran. Mm -hmm, totally. And actually, something you mentioned, I've, I've heard some commentators say Iran might have the country with the biggest like disconnect between the people in power and the people. It's just like such a... Like, it's just, they're so separate and it's such a um, disconnection there. So, yeah, you feel like the government is, though, in most respects, resp responding the same way, or you feel like it's more aggressive than in the past? Well, the playbook protests? of the Islamic Republic has always been to brutally crack down on protests. So, we definitely mm -hmm. saw that in November 2019 when they killed, you know, hundreds or, or thousands of protesters. We still don't have a complete number right. because the government has never provided that and never been transparent or you know, sought accountability against um, anybody who perpetrated that because it's the state itself that perpetrated it. Um, but I think here the challenging, I mean, the thing that probably um, is preventing um, even more bloodshed, though I hope like that's not where this is headed, but you know, given their history, it's really hard to not think that. But the fact that schoolgirls have joined the mm. protest, so, you know, we're getting so many videos showing yeah. schoolgirls as young as 12 um, taking off their mandatory hijab and screaming death to the dictator and other protest slogans. Mm -hmm. It becomes very difficult to see how the Islamic Republic is going to gun down an entire classroom of schoolgirls. It's just, I think, just on the optics, at the very least, it would be challenging for them. Um, we do see that they're engaging in violence against schoolgirls, mm. so they are taking violent yeah. actions against children, and I would definitely urge 
the world's, you know, organizations that deal with children's rights, whether it be UNICEF or otherwise, to issue pretty stern and condemnations and mm-hmm. statements about this. But um, I think the f- the the fabric of these protests is different in terms of it being so women led, women driven, and having the schoolgirls join. That perhaps it's um, you know we'll see how things go. But so far, the bloodiest interventions have been in regions with. Um, bigger populations of ethnic minorities mm-hmm. where historically the Islamic Republic has been the most brutal. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, and even I mean, think that that's uh, a theme that's been there throughout. But, um, you know, we're going into our last commercial break and I'm, I'm so happy to have you on to share these insights about what's going on, what's happening, what people can do as we've talked about. Uh, so after the break, we'll continue the discussion with human rights lawyer Gisu Nia. We'll be right back. back again my guest tonight human rights lawyer Gisu Nia and Gisu um, you know you've been involved with a lot of different aspects of this you know what's going on in Iran what's happening but I was actually curious when you started to get involved with what's going on in Iran yeah um, so I was working in The Hague so I, I started mm-hmm. out as an international criminal lawyer and I was in The Hague and um, there was the disputed presidential election of June 2009 mm-hmm. and the very violent crackdown on peaceful protesters that had taken to the street to ask where is my vote and that's really that was really the impetus for me to get involved because I'm you know Iranian American I wasn't living in Iran I had visited Iran plenty of times but I wasn't living in Iran and um, I had never been working on Iran, but then I saw what was happening, and I realized that, um, you know, the, the the skills that I had learned in The Hague when it came to investigation of atrocity crimes and being able to put together files for accountability's sake could probably be useful in this context. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I first got involved, and that was, I guess, what, 13 years ago? So it's been a, wow. it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Um, And there's been a lot of phases for folks that have been human rights defenders in this space and trying to open the space for human rights defenders on the inside because that space has increasingly shrunk and there are a lot of, you know, expert, well, I guess like quote unquote experts in the West (laughs) who have had a very different theory of change and I fundamentally believe their theory of change is very wrong and, Mm. um, and I think we're seeing that now. So what, if you want to get into that, what would you say was wrong or even what do you think is like the, how you would see the change? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, not to reveal too many details, but um, back in uh, 2009, there was obviously such an outpouring of support from all over the world for the Mm -hmm. protesters that were in the streets in Iran, basically demanding their vote. But, you know, that protest ultimately was really much about an institutional reform. It was about a change within the system. I mean, the slogan was, where is my vote? It wasn't challenging the core of the system. It was just asking for their votes to be counted. So, Mm -hmm. Um, that was a very organized protest. There were a lot of, you know, leading civil society leaders that were kind of, you know, pushing for that. And um, it's very different in character to the protests that are happening now, which really have no leader and are about getting rid of the Islamic Republic, essentially. Yeah. I think we can agree that that's basically what the protesters are saying. But at the time, I remember in the lead up to the JCPOA or what we refer to as the Iran nuclear deal, there were lots of um, folks who comment on the JCPOA who really saw human rights as a peripheral issue. So I remember in 2012, 2013, 2014, really trying to talk about human rights benchmarks that the global community would set for Iran's leadership and demand that they meet it because they weren't. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to open up, you know, this was in consultation with Iranian human rights defenders and lawyers in the inside of the country and basically seeing like, how could we open the space um, for them to be able to operate more freely because civil society was basically being dismantled. And I just remember the conventional wisdom of a lot of these folks who really weren't, you know, these folks at think tanks and otherwise who really weren't connected to communities on the ground, um, essentially thinking that human rights is not an important issue, that it's not a core issue, Mm -hmm. and that security issues need to be dealt with first, and that the economy needs to be sorted out first, and then discussion of human rights could follow after. And I think if you're a woman, I don't know how you could possibly have that position, Mm. given that if I'm in Iran, my testimony is worth half that 
of a man's in a courtroom, given that I do not have the same rights in marriage, divorce, inheritance, or custody as a man, and I'm essentially treated as a second-class citizen Mm -hmm. in Iran. Um, The mandatory hijab is just the most visible symbol of that gender-oppressive legal framework. And so, for me, it was just completely baffling how this could not be taken as part and parcel of how change would come in the country and that obviously respect for human rights is core to that and core to any long-term stability um, in Iran. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we see a lot of people have really changed their tune and have done some pretty sharp pivots because maybe they realized that their way of thinking wasn't actually on and maybe they had thought that there was a path for reform, but I just don't know what they were basing that on. If you Mm -hmm. look at the Islamic Republic, structurally speaking, they have an unelected supreme leader who makes all the decisions. He's the ultimate decision maker. There's a very convoluted system that looks like gives the veneer (laughs) of representative government or that there are multiple decision makers, but really, you know, the buck stops with him. Um, And he's been in that position since 1989. He's 83. He um, is increasingly paranoid and delusional if anybody watches his speeches. Um, I try not to, but sometimes we have (laughs) to... Well, (laughs) dictators almost always become more paranoid as they get older because they're just... I mean, understandably, you're creating more enemies. You're more worried about that. And I saw the chart. You put a chart on Twitter. Someone had put in it. It I really looked at it for like five minutes, and I couldn't (laughs) understand what was going on. And I think you said it was intentionally convoluted to kind of obfuscate that he's design. making all you know he has all the power but it looks yeah. like it's spread and there's some kind of checks and balances yeah. yeah no he definitely has all the power i mean the flavor of things can shift mildly you know with different folks in the presidency or whatever but ultimately you know everything comes down to him mm-hmm. um or the very powerful irgc um, and so when a Soleimani was alive, he was making a lot of the foreign policy decisions. In fact, like I don't know how much the foreign minister was involved in some of those decisions. But um, the point is that these are unelected officials. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in global media about presidential elections in Iran, but. I mean, those are not free or fair. The candidates are heavily vetted. I, as a woman, cannot run for president. Um, And um, it's really more of a selection. And furthermore, it's really just the position that Khamenei sends to kind of dangle out to world leaders. You know, he sends the president to UN General Assembly in New York because Khamenei himself hasn't left Iran in decades. but they have no real power. And mm-hmm. so we're talking about an unelected, unaccountable regime. The question is, how would reform take place within a system that doesn't really have political parties, doesn't have representative government, doesn't have a free press, doesn't have a flourishing civil society? Um, I'm just confused as to yeah. like what people see as the path forward. And so this argument about incremental reform, I think there may have been one period in time many decades ago where, you know, maybe the country could have gone in a different direction and, you know, but it didn't happen. And so um, a lot of those folks that previously, you know, had that analysis and sort of were very patronizing, I'd say, of anybody that had a human rights focused or a human rights centered analysis are Mm. really starting to eat their words because Mm. they see that they ultimately were not correct and um, that human rights really is going to be at the core of any like youth driven women led change in the country. Yeah, I mean when you you know you're talking about the green movement, where is my vote, which is understandable that they were frustrated about that, but of course when you're saying where is my vote, it in some ways legitimizes the government that's in power saying that I want them to accept my vote and we see a very different flavor in the the protest now. So yeah, that was 2009 and so you see it very differently now that now it's not about um where is my vote and within the government they want some like a, they want something totally different and, and what they want now is is a regime change which is very clear in what they're chanting and what people are are saying uh, in the streets um you know as we're getting close to the end of, of our time for today there's so many things i'd want to hear your perspective on but i also think it's important you know when we look at what's happening especially for the, those of us in the iranian diaspora outside of iran in trying to support our brothers and sisters in Iran, it's so important for our voice to stay unified. And I think so often in a movement, there's obviously it's never a monolith. There's going to be so many different perspectives, attitudes, desires, wants, you know, all the motivations. Um, but that unity is so important. So I just wanted to hear some of your thoughts on what you've seen or any thoughts on this uh, this concept of staying unified in this fight. 
Yeah, I think that one of the main things is not to lose sight of the fact that the current perpetrators, the current oppressors, and the people that really are responsible for the misery right now in Iran is the Islamic Republic. So to any degree that people are distracting from Mm -hmm. them being the ultimate target of accountability, the ultimate target of people demanding change and, um, you know, demanding that their human rights be respected, any distraction from that is helping the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. That's the way I view it in really simple terms. So when I see, you know, conversation threads about this activist did that or this activist did that, it just it's for me, it's just completely unhelpful. And it's just a win for the Islamic Republic. There can be people that have different shades of thought, all supportive of human rights, but different Mm -hmm. shades of thought. And they should all be welcomed into the tent of this human rights movement. There are some people who you know, were actively hurting the human rights cause um, over decades who are in the West and they were, you know, doing that. If they've changed their tune now, that's great, but they should not be in the media speaking or acting as representatives Mm -hmm. for anything because that wasn't their line of work. Um, That wasn't their focus of their activism. They're not in touch with people inside the country who are demanding change, and I doubt they've spent any time studying Iran's discriminatory legal framework or really, like, understanding human rights advocacy. So, you know, it's great if they want to now change their tune and voice support, but then, like, don't take to the platform on CNN or Al Jazeera or whatever and start to talk about things that you were not publicly saying just Mm -hmm. a year ago. Um, I think it's really important that we focus on the voices inside the country with a lot of the media that I've done. Um, I've tried my best to make sure that journalists are connected to protesters inside the country and that their voices are part of any package Mm. um, that we're putting forward. I'm always happy to give comments on maybe like some of the policy pieces or things that the international community can do, but for a view of like what the protesters want and all that, it's like, you know, big media outlets definitely need to get the voices of the people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, going to that that concept of staying unified and, you know, of course not everyone's got the same perspective, same opinion, same way of expressing things. You know, we have to accept that diversity of, of thought and, and, and ways of looking at things and even putting things out there and there's different generations. Even, you know, something I've noticed at the protests is you have, it, it is a beautiful coming together of like you see age you know range even of course non-iranians i've seen at many of the protests as well but you know within iranians like different levels of acculturation you hear it in the chants like sometimes they get americanized sometimes they get iran like persianized in the language and so there's this coming together and so we're, we're not a monolith of people so of course there's going to be these differences but if we stay unified we're much more likely to get the result which i think everyone who's protesting agrees with which is to to bring you know an end to the islamic republic in iran um and we need to keep that unity so even the chance i think like you know zan zen degi azadi is something that i don't know if anyone disagrees with that everyone's with that and i think it's important to stay with those messages that i think will bring people together and keep us together because likely this will be a marathon not a sprint using that cliche that we have to keep staying consistent going back to i think what we were talking about earlier that these things matter i hope people will stay consistent with the posts with keep because it's so you know how many times have we seen something catch the media's attention and be popular for a week and then people forget about it and it gets forgotten and the next you know thing gets part of the news cycle so i hope people will stay consistent sometimes you know we do something and we don't see an immediate result and we think well what's the point does it make a difference but um what i try to advocate for is to not just think of the result in the moment but think of our responsibility so i hope we'll each think of am i doing the most that i can do to help the people in Iran. That's all you can think about, not is it going to lead to a specific result that's out of your control. What is in your control is is what you do as far as your responsibility. So I hope people will, will keep focusing on that. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're closing out, I know this is a kind of a, maybe I should even checked with you before, but as far as, you know, people also say, how do I know what I'm learning is, is true or accurate? Are there any new sources you particularly would encourage people to pay attention to or you feel like are more trustworthy? Yeah, I think there are some human rights organizations Mm -hmm. that have been doing um, their work for decades in some cases and others that are super reliable. So in terms of videos online, videos coming out of Iran, I definitely recommend that people follow Hezar Punsara Tasvir, so 1500 Tasvir. 
Um, they also have an English page on Twitter, so they have Farsi and English, um, Persian and English, um, but you can always use the translate button as uh -huh. well for anybody who maybe can't read Persian. Um, but they are a very credible source of videos that are coming out f uh, outside the country. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend following them. They're also on Instagram. Um, also Harana, so human rights activists in Iran, great source. I think for human rights organizations, a global organization that does really good Iran work is Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. So they have the Amnesty Iran page, but they have some of the best, I think, well-sourced work, at least out of global human rights organizations. Mm -hmm. Then there are a number of Iran-specific human rights organizations, so like Abdurrahman, uh, Buduman Center, which really focuses on um, you know, documenting executions, um, and it was set up by sisters Roya and Ladan Buruman, who tragically lost their father when mm. the Islamic Republic assassinated him um, in France uh, decades ago. So mm. it's born out of you know their own experience, and um, they've done a tremendous job. There's a Center for Human Rights in Iran, which is. Um, has been around for quite some time and it's more of a newsy outlet where you can kind of, you know, a lot of content in English, which is helpful, I think, for global media. There's the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center that I'm board chair of. Um, it's been around since 2004. Um, they're not as much on the short form content, but you'll mm -hmm. definitely see that they'll be leading, you know, advocacy when it comes to accountability measures. They've been involved in litigation and they also have long form reports that are really helpful to understanding the human rights situation. So that's what I would follow, I think, that's in terms great. of organizations. No, I really appreciate that. And also, um, we do have to wrap up or else I had so many more questions to ask you, but I want to thank you so much for coming in, uh, human rights lawyer Gisunia, for sharing your insights, your thoughts on this. would love to have you back uh, sometime soon to continue, continue the discussion, but thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you for having me. Sure. And also a big thank you to Farhuda here in the studio. You've been listening to In Session with Dr. Farhuda Lakwi, Zan Zendegi Azadi.